Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Welcome to today's African Swine Fever Update event. This meeting is being recorded. There is no Q&A, but the chat is open. Um, the, the attendees can chat with the panelists, um, but not with each other. If you are on the phone and you need to ask a question, press star nine to raise your hand and when called upon, press star six to unmute yourself and star six to mute yourself once you've asked your question. And with that, I will turn it over to Katrina. Katrina, it is all yours. Thank you so much, Dale. And hello, everyone. I'm Katrina Rude, the State and Stakeholder Relations Liaison here at USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. Thank you for joining us. Um, during our second African Swine Fever Action Week. I am joined today by Dr. Jack Shear, APHIS Associate Administrator. We are here today to address questions that we received from across the industry and to get a look at the current state of African Swine Fever. Dr. Shear, before we get started um, with questions, is there anything you'd like to share with us? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to start out by personally thanking everyone that uh, has joined us for the webinar. I think the more that we can spread the word about this deadly virus and the clinical signs and what to expect, the better uh, chances we have of preventing it or uh, slowing its spread should it reach the United States. Thank you, Dr. Sharon. To get us started, um, what's changed about the global landscape that makes it important for us to focus on African swine fever now? As many people know, African swine fever has been around for more than a century and has devastated the swine industry across Africa, Europe, and Asia. The big break in 2018 in China, the world's largest uh, producer of swine, uh, was a, a, a real wake-up call. But then uh, in, 20, in July of 2021, African swine fever reached uh, the Dominican Republic in Haiti, which was the first time that we'd seen it in the Western Hemisphere since the late 1970s. Thank you, Dr. Shear. And what efforts has USDA taken in the last year to increase efforts to prevent ASF from reaching the United States? Well, the USDA and, and APHIS has, have always had interlocking safeguards in place to prevent not only the spread of African swine fever, but other diseases from uh, countries that, would, that had ASF or CSF. So those have been in place. The CSF uh, preventions have been in place since early 60s when uh, the disease was diagnosed at the first time in the Dominican Republic. So we had re restricted swine imports uh, from both the Dominican Republic and Haiti since the 60s. But because of uh, the proximity of the Dominican Republic and Haiti to the United States, especially Puerto Rico, we've, we've done some additional things in Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. We promptly increased our existing surveillance and mitigations in those areas and initiated, se initiated several new proactive uh, mitigations to prevent uh, efforts uh, to pre for prevention efforts in those territories. We have started, we started with uh, uh, establishing a foreign animal disease protection zone in Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. Now what this is, is according to WOA or the World Organization for Animal Health, a country can establish a zone, a protection zone uh, in, in their country in case there's infection uh, along the border or the uh, high risk areas of their country to prevent the whole country from being um, sort of in, in implemented in the event of a disease outbreaks, say in Puerto Rico. So what we really did in, in the protection zone is, is said, we're gonna do certain things in Puerto Rico to prevent the disease from getting there, enhance our surveillance, and I'll go into some of those in a minute, and do many other things, but we're also going to sort of make, make mitigations in place so that if the disease does reach Puerto Rico or the US Virgin Islands, we have in place, uh, interlocking standards to prevent it from getting to the mainland. So what we're doing in, in Puerto Rico, are, and, and there are many things, uh, in Puerto Rico, we've increased the surveillance of the regular swine herds in, in that area 
We've also done increased slaughter surveillance. We've took, undertaken a, an issue or a, a plan with our wildlife services people to eliminate the foreign or the, the feral hogs in Puerto Rico. And if you've been to Puerto Rico, you know that after um, Hurricane Maria in 2018, several of the Vietnamese pot belly pigs that were pets were either released or escaped and set up a breeding population along the coastal areas of Puerto Rico. We have undertaken a, a plan to and have practically eliminated those swine also. So in the, in the US Virgin Islands, we've eliminated the feral hogs that are there. We've undertaken the same project in our near elimination in Puerto Rico. We under, we've undertaken some increased work uh, for the landings of the YOLA boats. Uh, the YOLAs are illegal boats that land in Puerto Rico and they, um, they come from the Dominican Republic, they come from Haiti, they come from Cuba and they have people on the boats that are trying to escape or set up uh, uh, living quarters in Puerto Rico. They land at different parts of the island and they they bring their goods and their, sometimes their animals. So when those boats are, are uh, detected, our folks go out and do surveillance around the area for the uh, with the pigs to make sure that no disease has spread to them. Uh, we've, we've done a lot of things in Puerto Rico in regards to outreach and information, which I think is critical and, and sort of goes the same way as those webinars that we've started. We've done both social media, radio ads, TV ads, uh, just to explain the disease and to create an awareness among the people of what this disease looks like so that should it get there, it would be reported quickly and a foreign animal disease diagnostician could be dispatched to uh, do the testing and, and, and make sure that uh, the disease is detected early. The things we're doing in the, in the, in the uh, mainland follow the same pattern. We have increased our surveillance in regards to uh, the swine that are submitted to the local laboratories for testing any sick pig sample that comes into the laboratories, the non-laboratories or the the laboratory in Ames have, are tested for not only classical swine fever, but also African swine fever. So that's a point of surveillance. We're, we're working in four major states, Florida, Louisiana, Texas, and Alabama to, to really target those states in regards to high risk areas for their feral swine. We're testing those samples as we, as we uh, eliminate those swine in those in those areas so those sample numbers have gone up any sick feral hog or or, or have a feral hog that's found uh, dead is also tested so that testing has increased we've increased the work that we do with the customs and border protection people they are targeting flights from the Dominican republic and haiti for increased risk surveillance with with the dogs so that's ongoing. We've worked with the Coast Guard. Coast Guard is intercepting many of the illegal boats that would, would otherwise land in Puerto Rico or Florida. Uh, we've, we've had a good uh, relationship with them, so that's increased. Uh, we're also working with airlines and airlines um, in regards to flights and, and uh, screening uh, the, the uh, people as they get on the flights to make sure they understand they're not supposed to bring Pork, or pro pork products from these places. That's also in increased. We've done signage in many of the airports, the major airports in the United States where international flights come in that say that, that, uh, that pork products, pork and pork products are not to be brought in. And that uh, uh, I think that if you've seen the signs, it says pigs don't fly, meaning you don't bring uh, foreign uh, sausages or and that's how this disease spreads or any um any pork products into the united states so there's a lot of things going on uh probably left out uh, some of them uh increased work uh with the surveillance plan throughout the united states uh what we're testing and not testing uh the national vendor stockpile is 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 building up its 
its product line and for what they will have available should there be a foreign animal disease outbreak with large animals. Uh, they're looking at different disposal methods. They're looking at different euthanasia methods and, and products that we could use should that happen. And finally, our laboratory has been very busy um, looking at materials for testing, uh, developing products that we can use uh, in certifying and, and validating different test methods that are now being used in, in the uh, Dominican Republic and Haiti, such things as molecular test media, which is a media that you can put the, you can swab, uh, swab blood from an animal that is infected, put that into a tube. It maintains the virus, but it eliminates its infective capabilities. So essentially it's a, and it, and it doesn't have to be refrigerated that can move that way we can move samples uh, back and forth without risk of contamination in the United States or spreading the virus that way. So our lab's been very busy. They've increased our capacity. They've increased our testing of different samples. There's now seven different samples you can take from uh, swine beyond blood, uh, which include tissues that they could send for testing for ASF. That's a long answer to a simple question. I apologize for going on so long, but there's a lot going on and I just didn't want to uh, forget anything. Thank you, Katrina. Oh, no, not at all, Dr. Shear. And I think that's why we're all here today, right? So I appreciate your long answers. Um, and, you know, you mentioned the work that USDA is doing in, in Haiti and Dominican Republic to control and eradicate ASF. Um, could you touch a little bit more on, you know, what specifically USDA is doing on the ground there? I know you've been there yourself a number of times in the past year. And if you could share a bit more on that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, when we discovered the virus was there, and the, I have to go back to 2019 uh, when I came back from the um, the uh, meeting of the Americas in Mexico City in 2019. One of the concerns we had when we left that meeting was African swine fever had broke, of course, in 2018 and was was ravaging China's uh, swine population. A lot of discussion at that meeting about African swine fever, who could test, who had the ability to locate the virus, who, uh, which countries uh, had any kind of mitigations in place, which countries had uh, surveillance in place. And there was great concern that the Caribbean countries uh, could neither test nor had any uh, surveillance prop properties in place so that they could detect the virus. And it was pretty much the same in parts of South America, Central America. The only countries that seemed to have it under control as far as a testing or surveillance program were Mexico, Canada, the US, and possibly Guatemala. But again, uh, that's, that's, those are the testing, the sites that we're testing. So we came back from that meeting and I met with uh, the veterinary services people and I said, we really should try to put some money aside and do some testing in the Caribbean. So we, we, we set aside a small amount of money, $100,000 I believe is what it was, and we petitioned the Caribbean countries as, as a whole to say, if we provided the test media, we provided the kits, would you be willing to test and, and mail them to the United States for testing? Uh, the only country that took us up on that in 2019 was the Dominican Republic. And we tested the Dominican Republic on a quarterly basis. They sent us samples 2019, 2020, and then it wasn't until July of 2021 when you discovered that there was, there was indeed infection. They had sent us about 12 samples they were concerned with and said, test these first, because we have pigs dying. And sure enough, they did test positive for African swine fever. Now, since then, we have been in the Dominican Republic working on several programs. We've been working to, to make their lab stronger, I actually helped in, in providing funding for renovations for boss security, renovations for IT equipment that was, was put in and uh, just overall uh, a renovation of their molecular lab so that it could stand be a standalone lab for African swine fever. Uh, initially, they were doing both African swine fever and avian influenza. They would do an avian influenza in the morning, African swine fever in the evening, which put a great strain on their, on their, on their technicians. So we've, we've helped them with those issues. A strong lab in, in any country means the ability to find the virus has, has increased. And I think their lab 
has worked cooperatively, cooperatively with our laboratory. We sent two technicians over there uh, since July of 2021, and we've maintained that connection, testing and confirming any positives that they found uh, to move forward with uh, finding this virus. We've also worked with the Ministry of Agriculture to say, uh, to try to set up a surveillance program, uh, to try to work with them on uh, movement controls, uh, to, to talk with them about and train them on euthanasia and disposal techniques. Uh, we've we've uh, worked closely with other organizations such as World M Organization for Animal Health, FAO, uh, ORISA, and AICA to do other things. ORISA is working on a program with us to hire uh, personnel to work in the field to increase the capacity of, of, the, of the testing and surveillance program in, in the Dominican Republic. AICA has worked with us uh, to oversee the indemnity program that the United States is funding in the Dominican Republic. So all these groups have come together uh, to provide a collaborative effort on training on, on uh, any resource needs. And, and we've worked very well collaboratively in the Dominican Republic. The issue that's been, uh, that, that's, that's been, made it difficult is there has been a slowness to, um, to react or uh, to, the, to the virus we, in, in the Dominican Republic and Haiti. I'll talk about Haiti in a minute, but in the Dominican Republic, I think politically, there's been a challenge for them to get the work to move forward. And, and although we've been there to provide resources for over a year and worked with them closely, the response has been slow. So we're going to, we have sort of pivoted in our idea of eradication to say, eradication may not be on the table. Perhaps we should pivot and look at a control, at control measures and measures we could use to, to, to tamp it down uh, and, and provide greater mitigations in the United States. So that's the direction that we've decided to go. So this will be a long-term uh, project in the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Haiti has no resources. I, they have no electricity. They have no uh, ability to uh, provide gasoline at times for their surveillance effort. They have told us they have no funding for ASF. This is probably a, a problem in Haiti that does not rank highly uh, in, the, in the list of problems that Haiti has to face. Uh, they have a lot of work to do on other social social and economic issues in that country, and, and uh, African swine fever is probably not high on the list. Uh, we have provided samples, excuse me, a testing media for them to go out and get samples so they could send them to uh, the Fatal Lab in at Plum Island, and we have continued to test their samples and look at the uh, look at the virus now. Virus has changed. It, it was a highly virulent virus to start with. Uh, it has it has adapted and has changed and is now less virulent. And and the only way that we can find it for sure, because clinical signs are are not the same uh, as they were at the start, uh, where the pigs were dying. We have now a chronic form, uh, where the where the signs are more mild in the, in the in the pigs. The pigs will eventually die, and it's probably more serious because it's not as easily detected and can spread more easily in the chronic form. So we're working closely with both countries uh, in their ministries, but uh, there are huge challenges. Uh, the eradication effort that we started thinking that uh, that we could go in and quickly help them with to eradicate this disease has, as I said, been reevaluated, and we we are. We're looking at long-term uh, eradication efforts in the country uh, to, uh, to get that done. We also have had other countries express interest. Uh, Mexico has recently stepped forward and said they would be willing to help us in the effort. The Global Foundation for Transboundary Animal Diseases has also said that uh, they have great concern over this, the um, efforts and how things are proceeding in the Dominican Republic and Haiti because they represent the entire Western Hemisphere and they would like to see uh, things move forward more quickly. So I'll stop there and say that the United States has been there since 
uh, August of 2021, where we have set up a team that is there, seven people that are working closely with the Dominican Republic in the Dominican Republic to help them with their eradication efforts and to help them with the resource needs. Uh, it's something that uh, we know we can't do alone. Uh, we need the cooperation of the governments. And uh, with that cooperation, I think they can make great strides, but uh, it, it, and it has been difficult. Thank you, Dr. Schiff, for sharing that and, and for sharing your experiences and some of the challenges that we're facing, um, and really just for highlighting the importance of our international partnerships. Um, speaking of partnerships, um, one question came in, and what is the most important thing that industry can do in the face of the ASF's threats, and how are we working with industry? Well, we're trying to reach out to industry and these webinars and other, other educational processes, because biosecurity is the most important tool, and, and it's kind of the, the, same, the old saying of protect yourself, um, and biosecurity is, is your protection, keeping uh, your swine safe, keeping them biosecure, keeping the, them away from other uh, pigs, other especially feral hogs, uh, indoor. One of the things that Poland saw is that when they got African swine fever and their wild boar, they could not raise pigs outdoors. Now, if this gets into our feral hogs, we'll have the same situation. So biosecurity, biosecurity, keeping people away, uh, keeping other swine away, especially feral swine, uh, doing everything they can for, for biosecure, um, a biosecure farm. I, I, I talk to folks every day about the fact that, that you need to draw a box around where your, where your animals are. And that area has to be biosecure. And, and if that's the barn, if it's the outside pens, make sure that uh, nothing else can get in there. This is a contact disease. It's carried by fulmites and equipment and per personnel can bring it to them on their clothes. So that biosecurity has to extend to all equipment and make sure it's clean and disinfected, making sure that there's a change of clothes when they go in to work with the, with the pigs and that uh, they don't bring anything to the farm. They don't visit another farm uh, and that uh, you don't have workers working for you that also have pigs because those, those are all uh, situations where you could, you could be exposed and, and have no way of knowing uh, where it came from. So uh, proactively just get that preparedness, that biosecurity. And, and if you see the disease, if you see something, you know, people know their hogs. They see them every day. They look at them and they're the experts. They see something different. Don't hesitate to pick up the phone and call your state or federal office and get a foreign animal disease diagnostician out there. Call your vet, uh, or if you are a vet, call us and let us help. That's what we're here for. Uh, we want to make sure we find this if it comes as quickly as possible. And the only way we can do that is by having the industry work closely with us and report what they see uh, in, in case there, there's something that looks a little different. Now, this disease looks like a lot of swine diseases. It looks like pseudorabies, it looks like salmonellosis, it looks like TGE, some of the same signs. So we wanna make sure that if you see something that kind of looks the same as you've seen before, but uh, you maybe have a higher pig mortality uh, that you're not used to, then pick up the phone by all means. Thank you, Dr. Sharon. Thank you for sharing with us what biosecurity looks like in practice. I think that's something you know we all hear is biosecurity is of the utmost importance, but how that actually is implemented and, and what that looks like, I, I really appreciate you sharing that. You're welcome. And earlier you mentioned, you know, what would happen or what may happen if um, there is an ASF outbreak in the United States. And does USDA have a strategy in place in case of that? And what might that look like? So we have a plan that's that's been fleshed out with uh, the administration. One of the things that we'll put in place automatically if we detect ASF, There'll be a couple of things that we'll do. We'll do an immediate stop movement. That stop movement will last at, for at least the first 72 hours from the detection. Now, people say, well, why the stop movement? Stop movement is allow, allows us to do the tracing, find out where the pigs have gone, and perhaps get testing on those farms 
to make sure you know, or determine if spread has occurred. So that's one reason for the stop movement. The other reason for the stop movement is we need to find the, the infected farms. That, that testing may not occur as rapidly as we would like and, and the tracing. We have, to, we have to have time to do the tracing to find where these farms have gone. Now, the industry is helping us with this. Uh, the National Pork Board has developed um, AgView and they have the ability with that program to, to do uh, movement tracing, which will, which will help us uh, possibly find the farms more quickly and have less of an impact on the nation. So that stop movement will be in place. The Secretary of Agriculture will declare whether it's in feral swine or domestic swine will declare a state of emergency, a national state of emergency, which allows us to do certain things in regard to movements and, and quarantines and and the equipment that we use so that we can uh, get ahead of this disease and start uh, eradicating it. One of the things that um, will also be in place is we will look at the indemnity, putting that in place quickly and getting uh, farms, uh, getting to farms that are infected, getting the animals uh, euthanized and, and getting the cleaning and disinfection in place. This is a virus that you just don't want to sit around, sit around. And it's difficult to get rid of, and we have to do a good job on the, on the disposal and the cleaning and disinfection. And that involves everything from the time we find it to how and where we euthanize the pigs, whether they're moved uh, or allowed to move, and then uh, all the pigs that are around testing and tracing all the pigs around the infected premises. So there's time. This, this, this will take time and we need the time. Uh, and we have seen, and I think it, it's been a good thing that during the uh, slaughter plant slowdown in 2020, that the industry has the ability, and this is a good thing, uh, currently the way they're set up to hold hogs for a, for a slight period of time. And we have confirmed this 72 hour standstill with the industry to say, can you absorb this? And the answer has been yes. So it's a protective measure for the industry. Uh, I'm not saying that 72 hours is a magic number. It's a starting point and it, it may or may not uh, be enough. So those are the starting points. That's part of the plan. It allows the states and the federal regulators to, to find and get ahead of the disease. We know, I think we know that there's a, a, a huge number of hogs moving in the United States up to a million uh, hogs on the road every day going to 17 different states. So we want to make sure that we have a chance or that we, we create a chance to put a barrier in place to stop this movement and the movement of, of the pigs and the movement of the disease. Thank you. What is the possible impact industry if ASF is detected in the United States? I've seen I've seen different um, academic institutions that have kind of looked at the economy and what this would do. Uh, one prediction is that in the first year, it could cost the United States five billion billion uh, with a B, not not on an M, billion dollars in a year, and up to eighty billion uh, over the course of five to ten years. So, looking at that, we know that our industry exports 28% to 30% of their production. If we get this disease, other countries will immediately close off our exports. So all that produ production will stay in the United States. So we'll have a, a, an over, over stock of, of swine, which will definitely affect the price and will definitely affect the economy. Not only the economy of the swine industry, but all the ancillary industries and the people employed by industries that support the swine industry. So 80 billion is probably a, a, a low estimate, but um, we, would, we would definitely have to work closely to try to get uh, surveillance and testing in place to open up the possibility of exports from certain areas of the country. And that would require, and that's gonna be the difficult part, that requires great surveillance, and, and the ability uh, of the uh, veterinary infrastructure to say, we know where the disease is, we know where it isn't, these animals are safe, 
and we can we can we can talk to countries about what about our our uh, surveillance and 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 reason with them to ensure that they understand that they can then safely accept pork from certain areas. Now that's that's going to be a huge feat, and I think uh, if we use uh, high path AI as an example, we have been negotiating with countries for uh, the inclusion of, of instead of once we get high path AI shutting off the entire United States to, to negotiate with each individual country to say, we know where the, where the virus is and would you allow or would they allow us to go down to county level? Many countries will. That's taken 18 to 20 years of negotiation to get there. So we need to start the same discussion, uh, discussions with other with countries in regards to our our surveillance plan and, and uh, give them the assurances that we found the disease, we know where it's at, and we know where it's not, and perhaps we could begin exports again. Now, granted, with, remember this: that if we ask for that that um, understanding, we have to grant the same understanding to other countries should they get. African swine fever. Thank you. And is is would the impact be any different if it's if a, if ASF is detected on Puerto Rico or the U.S. Virgin Islands? Yeah, that's that's a great question because that's why we established the protection zone to protect the mainland in case it was detected in Puerto Rico or the U.S. US Virgin Islands. Now, other countries can decide what they want, but according to the world. Organization for Animal Health, we set up a protection zone. So that should not impact the United States should it, it be should ASF be discovered in Puerto Rico or the US Virgin Islands. However, um, I'll put a um, just to basically say this countries are, are uh, uh, allowed to decide what they want. Not all of them follow with the World Organization for Animal Health uh, and their standards. The United States is the same. Uh, we we uh, follow what they say, but we want we always want verification. So we'll have to do the same thing uh, for countries, I'm sure. <clears throat> but it, it may prevent an immediate shut off of our exports from the mainland because this protection zone is in place. Thank you, Dr. Sher. And is ASF something that small farms or pig owners should be prepared for? Is it more of a concern for large commercial producers? I would say that anybody that has any type of swine, be that a pot belly pig, uh, a, a show pig that they that they raise for the, the county fair, or the large producer, everybody's at risk. And everybody needs to take the same steps to prevent this disease from getting to them. Uh, and I'd say much like uh, the issues that we have with high path AI, outdoor production, increases the risk. So if you're raising your swine outside, the risk is, in, is increased. And those are questions that uh, we have to take. And, uh, and it doesn't matter if it's your pet pot belly pig in a, in a pen outside your house or a, a huge um, production facility that of oh, uh, three to 4,000 swine. Uh, both, both need to take the same precautions. Both need to protect themselves. Thank you, Dr. Shear. And I just want to note before we continue that we've received a few additional questions today, and we may not have time to answer all of them, but if you do have any questions that are not answered by the time um, this webinar concludes, you know, please feel free to send them to apispress at usda.gov, and we'll follow up with you in the next few days. Um, Dr. Shear, um, are there any misconceptions around ASF that you'd like to dispel? Yeah, I'd start with this one, and, and this is one that we're currently dealing with in the Dominican Republic. <clears throat> My pigs aren't dying, so they must not have the disease. When this disease change, remember that this disease has 20 different <clears throat> topotypes. So it has 20 different ways it can show up on your farm. The ones that are easy to discover are the ones that are highly virulent and kill the pigs rapidly. The ones that are probably more dangerous to eradication are the ones that don't have those clinical signs and you don't see the pigs dying. They may get sick, go off feed for a while. They may have joint swellings. They may uh, seem to not want to move around, but 
they, they don't die rapidly. It takes longer. So the misconception is that a pig can survive or get well uh, if it's exposed to ASF. The current, only, the current way, the only way that we can eradicate this disease is to test and remove the positives and, and uh, protect the negatives by keeping the positive pigs away so, and, and using good biosecurity. So any pig that tests positive for African swine fever, currently there's no vaccine, uh, although it's being worked on, uh, it's, not, it's not ready yet. And so the bottom line is our, our tool for eradication is elimination. And, and we'll do that through testing, two types of testing. We test them for immediate virus using a PCR. And that's if they're still shedding virus, they'll test positive. But if, if they've gone through the virus shedding phase, phase, then we look for the antibodies. If they have antibodies to the disease, they still need to be eliminated. And we'll use serology for that. So the misconception is that a pig can survive ASF, they can't. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shearer. And we have received a few additional questions that um, we're gonna try to address. Um, one question came in, um, do you have a perspective on how quickly U.S. exports could resume uh, where the zoning agreements are in place with international partners that take days, weeks? Um, what has the precedent shown? Um, that's a tough question and I don't have a good answer. And I would just say this, I tried to make a little bit of a comparison about uh, how diligently our export folks have worked on bilateral agreements with countries for export of, of poultry products, poultry and poultry products should uh, we get high path AI. We have been able to negotiate with some countries down to county level, some countries still uh, re restrict us at state level, and some countries based on uh, probably not, not science, but um, politics have still re resume or still restrict us at the state level. So that I would suspect that our people would work diligently should we get this virus and are working currently on things like um, the certificates that we sign and send abroad to make sure that we can we can hope to maintain trade with some of these countries, but I would say the reaction to African swine fever is immediate shutdown. And countries that don't export, like the Dominican Republic, they don't export to anyone. They consume all the pork that they produce. To them, it's not it's not a not a, a difficult situation. In the United States, it will be. So we'll, we'll we are working and will continue to work uh, with countries to to negotiate. Uh, what does that look like? We're we're, we're always in negotiation, working through the World Animal Health, Health Organization on things like, well, what, what about vaccine? What about, um, what can we do? Uh, and what, what is acceptable? And how can we move forward with some of these things to protect swine, to protect poultry, uh, and yet still maintain exports? Uh, vaccination has always been a big question that uh, countries have said, no, as long as you're vaccinating, we really don't want your stuff. So vaccination is, is an ongoing question at the World Animal Health Organization. Those bilateral agreements are important. Our people are, are, are currently doing those discussions, currently discuss, discussing the certificates and what they can or cannot say, what those countries will accept. Thank you, Dr. Sher. And with all the work that's being done on prevention of ASF and getting into the United States, what do you see as some of the biggest threats for the virus to get into the U.S. swine herd? I think this, this uh, virus moves very easily in products, okay, on, on, on cured sausage, things like that. It lives pretty well. And, and passengers, people from other countries bring these products with their traditional, they bring them for Christmas, they they have people that live here, relatives. They bring, they, they want them to, to bring a, bring us a Dominican sausage. So I think passenger baggage is, and passengers bringing these products is a high risk, and we are moving to uh, try to eliminate that risk as much as, as possible by putting preclearance um, factors in place in in the Dominican Republic. We're we're, we're discussing that how to get that done uh, to prevent that. We do that in Puerto Rico. No pork or pork products can 
uh, unless they're processed a certain way, can leave Puerto Rico. Uh, we, we have our uh, PPQ and, and uh, CBB people uh, scanning baggage and taking those products out has been going on since last Christmas. Uh, and so that's that's an ongoing thing. There's science that say don't put, don't pack this in your bag. That'll be removed. They do remove them. Uh, currently, we we are working with the uh, Dominican Republic. They've uh, the, the Orisa has trained dogs, about 22 dogs, to uh, sniff the bags for uh, pork and pork products or meat products. And uh, then uh, we're we're hoping that the Dominican Republic will pass legislation that will allow them to take that out of their bags. If not, we'll set up a notification system back in the United States when those people arrive, it will be confiscated at that point and taken away from them. So we're working on passenger baggage. I think that's the big risk. That's why we say don't let uh, people visit your swine herd. Uh, don't even, uh, even if you think they're safe, and if you do have people visit, they need to follow your biosecurity. And that's extremely important. Uh, but I would, I would uh, say the biggest risk I see currently, uh, this is a virus that can move in those pork products, those pork, and they, we've seen that in, in, in Europe where the pork and pork products, even the sandwich that's disposed of has been indicated uh, as, as a method of, of moving the virus from uh, across uh, France. So those are the kinds of things that I would I would say we need to do a good job of encountering. Dr. Scher, speaking of passenger baggage, can you tell us a little bit about the partnership that we have with um, Customs and Border um, Protection? Um, and do you have an idea of how, how much pork product is actually being stopped? I don't have, I, I, I see uh, individual reports from Customs and Border Protection people about what they confiscate and reports from our folks at, at PPQ uh, in Puerto Rico. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, uh, a few thousand kilograms um, each month. So I don't have the exact figures. I can get those for you and we can maybe talk about that on another uh, seminar. But uh, it, they're diligently working and, and confiscating things. And, um, the thing that's important is, again, I don't think people consciously put this stuff in their bags and have the idea that they would uh, bring it and, and infect the United States. They bring it because it's something that they've eaten culturally, they brought it across. Now we have the threat that it might have AS5, F virus in it. So we need to educate. And that's part of what we're doing in the airports and with our seminars, with our, with our outreach in, 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 in these countries to say, don't pack this thing in your bag, don't pack this virus. We know the virus is present in swine in the Dominican Republic. It's also present in their processed products. So we have to, we have to take precaution. That, that um, partnership with, the, with uh, CVB CPP is extremely important and the work they do and the work that the Beagle Brigade does uh, has been um, and always has been monumental to protect the United States uh, from disease incursions such as African swine fever. Thank you, Dr. Shear. And we had a question come in about the, um, the no animal movement. If ASF is found in Puerto Rico, would the continental United States still go over a 72, undergo a 72 hour no animal movement? Uh, I don't think we would. And, and here's the thing why I say that is because we don't import swine or swine products. It's minimal from Puerto Rico. And most of that is already processed in such a way that we would know that African swine fever is not present. I think there's one company, maybe two, that export pro swine products to the U.S. No, no swine, live swine come from Puerto Rico to the U.S. There's that's not a direction that they go. Most of the pork, most of the pork produced in Puerto Rico, they consume. They import more from the United States than they produce. So that's that's a, a huge uh, unidirectional flow. 
So I would say that should it be found in Puerto Rico, we would quickly do our our uh, trace trace back to see if anything whatsoever could come to the United States had come. And I would say that would be a no, that we would not find anything moving in that direction. Thank you. And another question received is, given the challenges that we're experiencing um, in Haiti, um, do we have any visibility on, on the spread of ASF um, in the country? Um, or how are we trying, how are we getting that information, if at all? Yeah, our information comes basically from the samples that they send us, and they generally tell us what, what uh, department. They have 10 departments in the country, uh, some of which are currently, there's a lot of danger to travel there. It's, it's uh, because of the gangs and the violence. So some of them are, are underrepresented in testing, but we know that all 10 departments uh, from testing that we've done are infected. Now, what we've heard from the Haitians, and this is interesting, is uh, most of the production in Haiti is, is on small farms, about 80 to 90% are small farms. And by small farms, I mean anywhere from five to 20 pigs, sows at the most. Those are the biggest, that, that's 90%. And they, they live off or sell uh, the, the pigs that they raise off of those sows. When uh, they get infected, they're, they're, what we've heard is by the time they go and test them and they get the results, they go back to tell the farmer that they're infected, usually most of the pigs or all the pigs are dead. So that takes, um, that takes a lot of, of uh, work to, for them. They, that's really all they can do. So the only way we know what's going on is by conference calls that we have with them, with their, with their agriculture and their uh, chief veterinary officer and through the testing that they're sending us. Communication with Haiti is also difficult. Oftentimes they don't have electricity to plug their phones in, the towers are down, uh, things don't work as, as you would think they would work and it's very difficult for them. Thank you, Dr. Shear. We had a question come in about um, maps and the, the comment or the question in, notes that the EU has zoning or interactive maps, uh, maps showing where ASS, ASF has been detected. Does APHIS have anything similar? I don't believe we do, Dr. Shear, is that correct? For that we, mainly because we don't have ASF in this country and, and we rely on WOA for most parts in terms of maps, is that correct? That's correct, and they're pretty accurate. Now, the, thing, the way that works is if a country gets infected, they have, and they, 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 send, well, they send their samples to a certified lab and, and the lab at uh, FATAL is certified by WOA. And they, they, we detect it, we, we uh, do the testing, we tell the country, hey, you're infected. They have a couple of days to call or to, to send the notification into WOA that they're infected. And that's, if they're a member of WOA, that's a protection for all countries that are member states uh, of WOA. So that's, they, they create the map, they, they create the data, they have the information. Thank you. Um, should we have to experience a movement stop, how would that be communicated to the industry? I, I mean, I imagine it would be some kind of mass communications that what we would undergo. We have a stakeholder list that we use uh, for notifications when things happen uh, in the industry. And we would, we would use that stakeholder list to make that announcement. I imagine the Secretary of Agriculture would probably be on TV to make the announcement to let them know uh, timelines would be very specific. Uh, we work, we'd work through television and uh, probably radio to get that out. And, and these days, probably also social media. We'd use all the tools that we could. Thank you, Dr. Shear. Um, we're almost coming up on time. And if there is, you know, one important piece or one or two important pieces of information that you want all of our viewers to walk away with today, what would that be? I think we always say this and it gets, uh, I know they get tired of hearing it, but protect yourself, biosecurity, protect your farm. It's your livelihood. It's how you make a living. We need to make sure, you need to make sure that, and if, and if you have questions about your biosecurity and, and, and whether what you could do 
there are people that would be willing to come out and look at your farm and help you because you're, you're there every day. You see it every day. And a new set of eyes sometimes help. And there are biosecurity experts that can help you with that and, and bolster that. Talk to your local veterinarian, make sure that uh, they're looking for those types of things. And just, just work with us. Uh, these foreign animal diseases uh, come up and I'll be honest with you, we don't get calls, enough calls on, on swine activity. There were, I think last year, there were only 25 investigations in swine for foreign animal disease. And that's just not enough when you look at how many swine are being raised. And I'm not saying call, if, you know, just to call for the reason of calling. I'm saying, remember that the disease looks like a lot of other diseases. And that uh, if you see something similar to what you used to see, but you're seeing more science, more, more, more clinical signs, more death, or it just doesn't look quite the same. Pick up the phone, call your veterinarian, have them take a look, call, have them call the states or the federal uh, offices in each state. They're, they're available, the numbers are available, and um, you know, follow up on that. The other thing I would say is we have a, a website and it's the Protect Our Pigs website. You go into www.aphis.usda.gov. There's a lot of information there on African swine fever, a lot of information on biosecurity. And you can, you can bone up or teach yourself what you're looking and what, you're, what you, what you uh, need to do for biosecurity. And you can, uh, again, protect yourself. So those are things to start with. Thanks. And I just want to share that, you know, the sources, the resources that are available on the APHIS website, that doesn't just apply to the large producers. Is that right, Dr. Shear? That's correct. And Dr. Shear, is there anything else that you want to share um, with our viewers today? No, just my uh, appreciation for them being on. Uh, I know that we, we've got quite a few people on. And I hope that if they didn't get to answer their, to their question or they want uh, additional information, I know we're gonna be doing other webinars and we'll, we'll get those in into the, the next presentation. And I promise you, uh, there's no question that we don't wanna answer. We wanna to be totally transparent. The more you know about this disease and how the disease works and how, the other thing is how you'll be treated should you get this disease, the, the better prepared we're gonna be and working together. And it is, this is about working together because there's no one agency in the government or, or in, at the state that's gonna be able to handle this. We need a three-way uh, unification, the producers, the state and the federal government to work on this if we get it. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much, Katrina. Thank you, Dr. Shear. And I wanna thank everyone again um, today for joining us. And again, thank you, Dr. Shear for sharing such great information with our viewers. I really encourage everyone to please visit the APHIS website at www.aphis.usa.gov. Search protect our, protect our Pigs for free resources information on what you can do to keep the U.S. swine herd safe. And again, if we did not get to your question today, um, please feel free to email us, email us at aphispress at usda.gov and we will sure, be sure to follow up with you in the next few days. And just thank you so much, everyone. Have a good day.